Hello. I have been told that I have a soothing voice and that I should read things. Therefore, we're going to do this interactive story while I am babysitting and the baby is currently sleeping. So, Buried is an interactive story. The plot will change based on the choices you make. The story is broken into five chapters, placed straight through or at your own pace. There's no waiting and no pauses. Enjoy and choose wisely. <clears throat> I open my eyes and the first thing I want to do is scream. I'm flat on my back and everything seems to hurt. The trees overhead look familiar. It's a clear night sky, almost beautiful, except for the fact that this means I've been out cold for at least six hours. But there's something wrong. I don't remember what, but something happened and... My head. My god, my head hurts. And a ringing in my ears. Was there an accident? An explosion, I think. I remember Dennis screaming. But after that, I can't remember. As I sit up, I notice that my hard hat has been thrown off. I look around the area, but it's not here. It feels strange to go anywhere without my hard hat but I've got to find the other members of the crew. They could be in danger. I neglected to mention that there's a dog on this couch with me. Hi, dog. He's currently looking at my face. Sub puppy. Okay. I'm gonna search for my hard hat, because safety first. I get up on Shaky's legs and look around for a moment. A few nearby trees look like they have been splintered and broken at the base recently. They certainly weren't like that, like this earlier. Searching for the hard hat feels normal. It makes me feel like maybe there isn't something wrong here. I see it behind a fallen log, about ten feet away from me. How it was thrown so far is beyond me. Driven by nothing more than habit, I walk over to it, pick it up, and place it on my head. Next, I walk over to the center of the logging site, and I don't like what I see. That's not good. The logging site looks like a bomb was detonated right in the center. I don't know where to start. The one load we had managed to stack on a truck for the day is overturned, the trailer bent and the logs hanging off the back. Where the hell is everyone? My head is killing me, and this ringing in my ears, I can't hear anything. Not birds, not my footsteps, nothing. It makes me wonder if I hit my head after my hard hat flew off. I run through a quick mental checklist to make sure my brain is still working. My name is Roger Hastings. I'm 41 years old. The year is 2017. I own a small logging company, and we've been logging in this strip of Kentucky woodlands for almost a month now. Okay, so my brain works. That's a relief. But it also makes me fearful, because something is certainly not right here. I look around the logging site, my mind trying to figure out what has happened. Just about every piece of equipment has been overturned or tilted. Let's look at the debris. <coughs> there are bits of debris everywhere. There are fragments of the five gallon bucket I kept our work rags in, a loose chain a loose saw chain, and an overturned gas canister. Had there been an explosion, all the fuel in sight would have started a fire. But there's no charring, no burning. Nothing. I walk through the area where Dennis had been working. From the looks of it, he'd been moving slowly. He'd only taken down four trees today. His metal lunchbox is open, an indicator that he had been taking an early break. But he's not here. No one is here. Where the hell is everyone? I could try to make a call on my cell phone, but its battery is already running really low. Not that it matters. The reception is crap out here. Yell out. Save the phone for later. Hey, guys, where is everyone? Tony? Dennis? Frank? Joe? But their names fall flat among the wreckage. I get nothing back other than scaring a few birds overhead. Might as well start walking and try to find some answers. The highway is almost a mile back through the woods, down the gravel road we used to reach the site. Maybe the crew ran away for help. 
but why would they have left me? Were they scared? Out of sorts? Maybe I can catch up to them. But with my truck over turned over on its side, it looks like I'll be walking. My god, I can't even remember what I was doing before waking up on my back. Wait, what's that underneath the bulldozer? Oh my god, it's a leg. It has to be either Tony or Dennis. The dozer looks unstable, like it might roll over some more. It might not be safe to get close, but at the same time, I can't just leave him there. I'm gonna go look. Hey, I yell. Are you okay? Are you alive? Holding onto my hat, I skip over the wreckage equipment and stray logs to get closer. I can see a bit more of the leg. The jeans are soaked in blood. I recognize the work boots. It's clearly Tony. His leg is bent at an impossible angle, nearly crushed flat. The closer I get, the more, be more apparent it becomes that Tony didn't survive. I'm just going to leave the body. There's nothing I can do for him now. I start to back away slowly. In my shock, I stumble back, suddenly tripping over one of the stray logs. My head collides with one of the logs as I bite the ground, but my hard hat does its job. Thank God I decided to look for it earlier. But what's more startling is the realization that Tony is dead. Looking at him, I feel something rising up in my throat, and I don't know if to scream or vomit. But I have to push it away. If I lose my cool right now, there are too many questions that will go unanswered. Shit, I can't believe this. Tony. He had two boys. He coached his oldest son's basketball team. Baseball team. He was the hardest worker I had, and was one of the on most honest and reliable men I knew. This isn't right. I can't stay here. I have to find Dennis, Frank, and Joe. I have to find out what happened here. <coughs> As I walk through stacks of logs from the last week or so of work, everything feels frozen. This high-pitched sound in my ears. It's terrible. It keeps happening every few seconds, and it sounds like it's coming from far away. I can't help but wonder. Is it my ears? Or is it something else? The silence out here is creepy, and there's a smell, like the atmosphere after a bad summer storm. I might as well admit it. I'm a little scared. Everyone is missing, and it's dead quiet out here. There doesn't even seem to be a breeze to rustle the leaves and branches. My right knee hurts like hell. My head was hurting so bad before that I never even noticed the pain in my knee. I must have hurt it during the, well, during the what? Accident? Or... Wait, is that Dennis? I see him sitting on the ground, motionless, about 30 feet away. I'm gonna walk up to Dennis. Excuse me, dog. I'm sitting on this couch too, you know. He's just sitting there, not moving. I walk up slowly next to him. Dennis? Hey man, can you hear me? I tap him on the shoulder. He looks up looks up at me from the ground, clearly coming out of a daze. Yeah, Roger. I hear you, he says. Dennis is built like a wrestler and has a tough personality to match. But in this moment, he looks disoriented and even a little anxious. Though I'm glad to see him, the fear in his usually confident face is alarming. What the hell happened? What's going on? He asks. I'm just gonna be honest. I don't know. The crew is missing. Missing, Dennis says. Where do you think they went? I'm not sure, I say. But it has me pretty freaked out. Something's not right here. Still sitting on the ground, he looks around the woods, as if he is just now understanding understanding the severity of the situation. The equipment was overturned. The dozers, too, I say, shifting my hard hat and wiping my forehead. You okay? I ask him. Yeah. Just shaken up. Me too. This might have been the most intimate conversation Dennis and I had ever had. While he and I have always been on good terms, we've never been particularly close. I've always respected him, though. Sure. He's come to work a few times looking like he'd been in a bar fight the night before, but I've also seen him do an enthusiastic impression of a dinosaur as he played with Tony's kids while they waited for their dad to finish up his shift. It's then that it hits me. Dennis and Tony were good friends. I'm not sure I want to rattle him with the news of Tony's death right now, 
Not before we know what's going on. But he has a right to know. He does. Tony is dead. Dennis's eyes fixate on me, startled. He... He was crushed under the dozer, I say. Dennis pauses for a moment, like he is trying to understand what I said. His eyes narrow, and his bottom lip quivers. Shit, he says, and I can tell that he is fighting back tears. He and Tony had been tight, almost like brothers. Hey, he adds quickly, as if trying to escape the reality of Tony's death. Did you see that light? No, I say. What did you see? I don't even know, Roger, he says. It was like this flare of white light. It came right up out of the ground, like an explosion. So there was an explosion, I say. Maybe it was some equipment, or... This was no equipment, Dennis interrupts, agitated. This huge ball of light came right out of the goddamn ground. <clears throat> Where'd it go? It just shot up into the sky until it was out of sight. When? I'm not sure, he answers. But I had finished about ten trees for the day, and was about to top one. That's when it happened. You're almost done with ten trees, I asked. Yeah, he says looking at the ground. You know, I wouldn't want to take a lunch break until I was done. And that's when the light blew up? And that's when that light blew up. Why? You don't believe me? I believe you. <coughs> he saw what he saw, I think to myself. He has no reason to lie about this. My god, are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine, he says. But if I'm being honest, it scared me pretty bad. And if it's all the same to you, I'd like to get the hell out of here. We both stand up and start heading towards the road. It isn't until we start moving that I see Dennis is wounded. His right side is coated in blood, the red seeping through his blue work shirt. There are splatters of it here and there, but also a very large red splotch that makes me worry. Are you in a lot of pain? I've been better. I don't know how much longer I can stay on my feet, he says. What happened? I ask. I'm not sure, Dennis replies. I must have gotten thrown or hurt somehow from that light. It's then that I notice that the strange ringing noise is still filling the air. Hey, I say, stopping. Do you hear that high-pitched ringing noise every once in a while? Dennis looks scared when I ask him this question. He just nods. I thought it was just me, he says. He looks out of sorts and uncertain. I've never seen him like this before. It's obvious that he's looking for some reassurance. Even though I'm his boss, there's something very unnerving about this. It's probably nothing. Let's be realistic, I tell myself. I might as well try to be empathetic. Out here in the middle of the woods, the ringing could be anything. Maybe a car alarm from through the woods or something. Still, even my passive comment seems to have reassured Dennis. He looks a bit calmer, more relaxed. We both start moving forward and don't say another word. Did you try to call Frank? Dennis asks. I knew he had his cell on him today. Not yet. Luckily, I still have some battery left. Pull out my cell and call Frank. Happy I didn't make that call to Dennis earlier. It rings, but he doesn't pick up. But then I hear his phone go off, behind the stack of logs. Dennis and I give each other a look. As the phone goes to voicemail, I hang up, and we walk behind the logs to find Frank's phone on the ground, abandoned. We look around for Frank, but find nothing. Not a single trace. It's then that I notice something really odd. A ten-foot-wide hole in the ground, right near where the phone was. But there's no stray piles of removed dirt or rocks. It's clean, smoothly dug, cutting into the earth. Wide, but only a few feet deep. It looks unnatural, like the ground was just deleted. No shovels or diggers used. Dennis walks over to it. This looks like the same kind of hole where I saw that light come up from the ground, he muses to himself. I say nothing. My mind is spinning, but I don't know what to think. We need to get out of here, Dennis mutters. At that moment, the ringing noise carries through the forest again, sending a shiver down my spine. Dennis is right. There's something strange going on, and we may, might not be safe here. But that ringing sound could be a clue to where the rest of the crew went. <coughs> hmm. Dennis is injured, though. So. Let's avoid that. 
With that, we turn and start walking to the west, in the direction that I'm pretty sure leads to the road. <clears throat> it's sort of embarrassing. I might have been a logger for nearly 15 years, but I'm finding it easy to get lost in these woods. The trees are so thick in places that the moonlight doesn't even reach the ground. It's easy to get turned around. My only hope is that I can find the overgrown dirt road that will lead us back to the highway. You sure we're heading the right way? Dennis asks. Pretty sure, I say. I turn to him and see that he is clearly in pain. It's at this moment that we come on upon another one of those smooth holes. This one's even stranger because the nearby tree has also had a chunk cut out of it. <clears throat> the arc goes smoothly through the ground and then up through the trunk, like a cartoon wrecking ball blasted through both of them. What the hell are these things? Dennis whispers to himself. He takes a step into the hole, his books creating imperfections in the shape, like footprints in the sand dune. I'm going to walk around it. I walk along the edge, each step sending pebbles down into the hole, ruining its perfect shape. I'm amazed at how smooth it is. Even rocks that were under the earth have been sheared to fit the spherical shape. But as I'm noticing this, I notice Dennis's feet start to sag. Dennis, get out, I start, but don't finish. Before he can react, the ground is giving way and he's falling. I try to step back, but the fissure that opens up disintegrates the ground beneath my feet as well. I crowd in surprise, and can barely hear Dennis letting out a curse as we go down into the earth. <clears throat> that was a bad idea. Well, now I'm in a cave. The fall isn't a long one, but when I hit something a few seconds later, it hurts like hell. The wind goes rushing out of me when I hit, and a sharp pain flies through me. What the hell, I say once my breath is back. Beside me, Dennis is slowly rolling over to get to his feet. I look up and see the hole in the ground where we fell through. It looks to be about ten feet over our heads. It's completely dark, but there's a small flicker of light further into the cave ahead of us, and a solid wall of rock behind us. It looks like the only ways out of here are further down the cave, or up through the way we fell in. Dennis might be able to boost me up there, but with his injury, I'm not sure how stable he is. He might drop me. Let's head through the cave. I decide we better not risk hurting ourselves trying to climb out. As we turn to head to the cave, I take a closer look at the light further ahead and realize it's artificial. We both start heading towards it instinctively. As we step into the light, panic gently gnaws at me because what I'm seeing makes absolutely no sense. It's no longer a cave or hole, it's a long, sparsely lit corridor. It's a massive corridor, in fact. It seems to go on forever. This corridor is mostly dark, with emergency lights every ten feet or so. I turn to my left and see that there's a door which appears to lead upwards to the outside, but it's locked tight. I push as hard as I can, but no luck. Dennis, help me with this, I say. He comes over and we both try to kick the door open, but it doesn't budge. For some reason, someone doesn't want people getting out of here. Looks like we're heading down the qual down the hallway. <sighs> quietly or quickly? Well, Dennis is still injured, so we're gonna go quietly. <clears throat> I feel like a ghost, like I truly have no business being here. Dennis leans on me for support. We move slowly, our feet not making a sound. If anyone is in here, I want to make sure they don't hear us. We tiptoed forward as softly as we can. As I carry Dennis to the far end of this otherwise featureless place, I see a flight of concrete stairs leading down. I have to set down Dennis down on the floor. His weight is killing me. Dennis, you okay? Stop worrying, man, he says. I'll be okay. I just need a minute to rest. But looking at him, I'm not so sure. I can still hear the ringing noise every so often, coming from somewhere in here. I look ahead at the concrete stairs, pointing towards them so that Dennis sees them. Can you make it down those stairs? I ask. 
He stands up slowly, and is visibly making an effort not to fall back down. Yeah, he says, and sounds a little irritated. He starts for the stairs without me, and I have no choice but to follow. We approach the stairs, and by just looking at them, I get the sense that we're crossing a, some sort of line here. There may very well be no going back. As I head down the stairs, I notice that they look aged. That damn ringing noise is somewhere below, louder than ever. I feel like I'm walking into the cellar of a haunted house, the light becoming scarce as the stairs we take as the stairs take a slight turn. I can feel the temperature drop. Dennis makes it a few steps down before he's leaning on the wall. He's breathing like he's just finished a marathon. Yeah, let's give him a break. Let's take a break, I say, putting my hand, hand towards his shoulder to help steady him. Dennis lets out a sigh. Thanks. I don't feel too great, boss. As we both squat down on a stair, my mind seems to lock in to the unknown fate of the rest of my crew. Frank is married, and I've met his wife a few times. Nice woman with a huge laugh. My heart sags a bit when I realize I might never again get to hear him belting out classic rock tunes during lunch break. Joe... Well, I don't know much, too much about him. He's 20 years old and is considering community college. His folks are deadbeats, so he's been providing for himself since the age of 16 or so. Maybe I can still find them and still get to hear Frank singing in his deep baritone voice after a few too many drinks. After a few moments, Dennis says, All right, let's keep going. We both stand up, leaning on each other. I have to make Dennis stay behind me as I stick my foot out in search of the next step. I can't help feeling a child has a very powerful feel as a very powerful feeler fear seizes me. I'm expecting a monster to reach out of the darkness, slicing into my throat. After what feels like forever, we come to the bottom of the stairs. We're closer to that ringing noise below. A door spits securely in the wall and looks just as out of place here as I feel. A sliver of light sleeps through, illuminating the area. The door has what looks like a panel with lots of labels and lights. A small embossed print above the panel says Level 1 Entrance Gate, Transport Sector, and there's a button with no label. Let's inspect the panel. <coughs> the panel looks like a diagnostic or alert system of some kind, each label meant to communicate some status. Lockdown engaged, experiment in progress, shutdown engaged. They all appear to be off, but one of the f phrases has a slowly blinking red light next to it, the only powered light in this whole thing. Abnormal entity breach. What the hell? I slowly push the door open when Dennis suddenly steps in front of me, taking the lead. Let's go, he says. I want to find out what the hell this place is. As Dennis walks through, that ringing or beeping whatever it is gets a little louder. The door closes behind us with a click. I can't help but notice the wobble in Dennis's step as he lets out a grunt. You sure you're healthy enough to keep going? I ask. It doesn't matter. I don't want to be in the woods right now. He seems scared. Something I've never seen before. Angry? Yes. Upset? Yes. But Dennis is never scared. What did you see? I don't know what it was, boss. It was like someone had left a radio on, crackling, but we didn't have any radios at the site. It was... I don't know. It was like something in the forest was moving. I gave him a doubtful look as he cast his eyes to the ground, frustrated. I know how it sounds, he says, but I know what I felt. It was like walking into a funeral parlor, feeling death and gloom everywhere. I've been so preoccupied with my own fear that I nearly forgot about the ringing noise. It had just become a background noise. We take a few more steps and I can now see clearly where we are. It makes no sense. Yet another thing that simply seems out of place. The shapes and muted colors of metal are easy to identify. But it just doesn't belong here. Alright, I'm going to end this episode here. At the end of chapter 1. Pick up chapter 2 in a second. Thanks for listening. I hope you uh, agree with the choices I make. 
and if not, play it yourself.